Hi, it's Lee and welcome to the Test Economist. I think Mercedes may have a chance of maybe even being the number one selling EV for legacy. Mercedes, you might think, am I insane? Not many people can afford a new Mercedes. And you're right, and that's why everyone will buy a Tesla. But some people are too good for a common Tesla and must have something more special. Everyone has a Tesla, I want something different, I'm special. You might think that then I'll get a Hyundai or something like that. And there lies the problem that all legacy autos face. They aren't making a profit on their EVs. You see, there's a fundamental difference between battery propelled vehicles and ICE. An ICE car can pretty much have any engine size and the performance will come down to the power to weight ratio and the range, well, that just comes down to the size of the gas tank. If you want more range, make a bigger gas tank. The smaller or more basic the engine, then the lower the cost. The larger, more complex, then the higher the cost. For example, there's a big difference between the cost of a straightforward engine in a Volkswagen Golf compared to a V12 engine in a Ferrari. However, the economics for a battery are very different. You can't just serve up a smaller battery for a lower cost car, or the equivalent would only give you about 50 miles of range instead of maybe 300 miles. That's not enough range. Not to mention that performance would likely be at a dangerous level. This is not suitable for the major auto markets. They would much rather choose an ICE vehicle. The other EV companies have to offer better value than their ICE offerings. Well, somewhat if you ignore subsidies, and they do eventually have to also do that with a profit, a reasonable profit too, if they want to maintain similar market capitalizations they have today. Therefore, there is this fixed cost of the battery for every electric vehicle. They also need to be offering around mid 200 miles of range or else consumers won't buy them. So there's an entry level cost of an EV with this battery. Of course, the motors and drivetrains too. It's somewhat of a hurdle that must be cleared or else there's no profit. In fact, there are massive losses, which is manageable if you're selling in low quantity and have a massively profitable ICE business to support it. It's when ICE sales start to diminish and you try and ramp up electric is when the fit hits the shan. However, the auto industry is about marketing as much as anything else, creating brands that people can identify with and feel value for a price point they're seeking. If a brand has more class, prestige, heritage, etc., then people are willing to pay more for that. As for many, a car is considered an extension of themselves. The mistake that Henry Ford made, thinking they just wanted cheaper Model Ts and thus lost a lot of his massive market share to GM and eventually Chrysler. Which brings us back to Mercedes. Now, if the cost of manufacturing an electric Mercedes is similar to an electric Hyundai, sure, there's the additional cost of the Mercedes refinement and extra features that also accompany the brand, but they aren't major relatively. And Mercedes will also upsell a lot of those extras anyway. Well, what are you left with? A Hyundai that costs perhaps $40,000 to build and a Mercedes that costs $45,000 to build. However, the market may only be willing to pay 35,000 for the Hyundai but 50,000 for the Mercedes. The prices are just for indicative purposes, but what does that leave us with? One profitable car and one losing car. The other EV companies are going to struggle to get their costs down low enough to meet their brand. The prestigious brands can do that as consumers are willing to pay more for a Mercedes. And what do brands like Hyundai represent? More so value for money. But who is owning the value for money EV market? Well, Tesla, of course. They're the best value vehicles on the planet Tesla will take the mainstream EV market for sure. There is no doubt about that. The Chinese EV market will be small too, at least outside of China. So Tesla will be the mainstream brand. They may end up with a global market share of 50% or perhaps much higher like 80%, depending on what market share we're even talking about, whether it's auto sales or transit, including robo taxis. But either way, there may be some gaps in the market. A lot of people want their car to be different from other people particularly if you have a large ego and want people to know just how much more successful you are than everyone else. If everyone has a Tesla, then how can you stand out? Sure, you can customize it and wrap it in pink with a body kit and aftermarket wheels, but that doesn't tell people you're a big success either. So it's possible there will be a market segment available for a more prestige brand instead of Tesla. I don't think there'll be much of a market for a lower cost brand though, again, because of that initial entry cost of the battery but no one can make cars for less than Tesla. So eventually Tesla can just undercut everyone. And on top of that, there is no lower cost form of transit on road than a robo taxi. And I have talked before about niches that may be left in the market, but it's tough when you don't have economies of scale. Okay, sure, there could be an opportunity for some really cool EVs like the electric DeLorean, but it's not gonna be a big seller. It will cost a lot, the range will be bad, and the performance won't come close to a Tesla. 
Teslas are always going to have the best range and performance relative to battery size and cost. It's as simple as that. So Mercedes have a massive history. They literally invented the ICE car. No one goes back further than that. Anyway, I went into my local Mercedes dealership yesterday and spoke to one of the dealers and she showed me their EVs. She loved them and said it was much better than the ICE cars and was clearly the future. Half her inquiries are for electric these days, she said, but half of them still struggle with range and only buy them as a secondary vehicle rather than primary. But she was very excited about electric and she was a former V8 fan. She showed me all the current vehicles they had and the electric lineup. I even got to experience an EQS. Oh yeah, the EQS, Mercedes answer to unadulterated luxury in an EV. This was the fully optioned AMG model too, with this massive screen on the dash. There weren't even that many buttons. And I have to say, I was absolutely underwhelmed. I sat in the seats and tried to experience it as much as possible. I interacted with the screen and user experience. Admittedly, it was a bit more responsive than most ICE cars and entertainment units in the past, but there was very little going on. Just massive screens. Well, I say massive, but in reality, the total viewing area of the main screen was smaller than a Model S. In other words, if you're watching Netflix on it, then it's a smaller screen. Of course, that's a big if, because there is no Netflix or YouTube or Disney or anything exciting in the Mercedes. No, nothing like that. Although you can, however, change the interior lighting to just about any color you so please. Cool. The sales lady admittedly did say that Mercedes does have no FSD close to Tesla and tried to tell me that that was what Teslas tried to compete on, which she was partly correct. However, the range and performance might also be another unique selling item that Teslas also offer. Oh, and at that affordable price. Well, much more affordable than a Mercedes. It felt very basic. They'd even tried to hide the air vents somewhat by not placing them in such high profile areas and halving the height but they still exist. She showed me all the electric vehicles they had, the EQA, the EQB, the EQC, and soon the EQE. They all looked very similar, just SUVs with a slight difference at different price points. Something that the Model Y would be suitable as an alternative for all of them. And of course would cost less and get more range. Oh, and offer a ton more features with a much larger screen. And of course does come with autopilot as standard and FSD is an option that actually does work. Although she did tell me that Mercedes does have all the latest safety features when it comes to driving. Sure, I don't think it comes close to Tesla's safety features though, but four different varieties of very similar SUVs is kind of strange. I mean, obviously they aren't hitting volume production, so why bother starting another production line of the same vehicle? May as well make something slightly different, at least to target another market, I suppose. They sell the SUVs or crossovers because that is a highly popular market segment and can justify a higher price tag. There's more room there for profit or as legacy autos call it, recovering more of the costs of the battery. On top of that, the larger a vehicle, the larger the battery can be, which means more cells can go into the battery and thus increase range further. This tends to be all non-Tesla's EV strategies of increasing range by stuffing more cells into the battery. Of course, they still don't get close to Tesla's range. The cars cost a lot more as a result and handle and perform a lot worse. In fact, there are very few electric sedans that aren't Chinese the Chinese EVs have to use sedans because they are at least lighter and can thus work with LFP cells. The range on a Chinese LFP SUV would be horrendous. Same for trucks. Another reason Chinese vehicles can't compete in the US as SUVs and trucks are quite popular over there. Now you might also think that Porsche is another brand with a similar advantage and I would agree with you. And they managed to sell their Taycan for as much as nearly $200,000 and people pay, despite it being so inferior to the much lower cost Model S Plaid. Some people have too much money, they don't care, and they want to boast about how much better Porsche is than a Tesla, despite being slower, with less range, not as safe, and not even close to as many features. But this is for a sedan, a large sedan, hence why they went for the large sedan to make sure it was large enough to fit their battery in. They will also have an electric SUV too. But after that, Porsche hit quite a big dilemma. The brand is synonymous with the iconic 911 a car with not too dissimilar a 0 60 at a time than the Plaid at around 2.2 seconds. Very impressive. It handles superbly too, being mid-engined with a short wheelbase and four wheel drive. It also costs very little to make relative to its price tag and thus carries a huge gross margin. Porsche is a sports car company. At least that's what its heritage is based. But how can Porsche fit a massive battery into a 911 with such a short wheelbase? If Porsche went all electric, they would have to give the 911 a totally new design. 
it would lose its iconic shape that it has held onto it since its inception. An all electric sports car is not impossible. Rimac have achieved it. Hey, even the original Neo too. They can look absolutely amazing and have stunning acceleration, but to give up the 911 shape may be too hard for them to let go. Then you might think Ford are doing well with the F-150 Lightning, but it's just a niche vehicle for select target market and it hasn't had to compete with the Cybertruck yet. A vehicle whose full specs we aren't even aware of yet and have no idea what they've added over the last three years since its reveal. Of course, none of the Legacy's offerings will have range close to Tesla's, but they also suffer with a charging network. They are being obtuse as to not join the Tesla charging network. And this problem is for every non-Tesla EV. It is worse for non-Teslas as their range is obviously worse. And then they have less of a charging infrastructure to support their lack of range. Oh dear, they really are in a pickle. And anyway, like the salesperson told me, they don't have FSD and they won't have FSD and Tesla will. And like I say, if you think Tesla are popular as EVs, wait until you see their popularity as an AV. Look, there is potential for Mercedes to be a player, but their only selling feature is Mercedes refinement. And Teslas, in my opinion, are far more luxurious anyway, and offer features with true value rather than just glamour. So it's really just people who want to show that they can afford more than a Tesla. And I don't think this is even an appeal for the younger generations, possibly just baby boomers. But not buying a Tesla because you don't like the company or CEO would have been like not buying incandescent light bulbs because you didn't like Edison or General Electric. But there probably are some people out there. Thanks for listening. Please hit the thumbs up and subscribe. You can follow me on Twitter and talk to me on Patreon.